Well, here we are. Third Sunday of July? No, is this the third Sunday? Fourth Sunday. Fourth Sunday of July, isn't it? Yeah, we have five Sundays this July. And you've been patient for the last couple of Sundays as I've plowed through this sermon series on telling the truth. This is the third in a 13-part series. No, so I'll... <laughs> No, this is, this, I'm not telling the truth there. This is actually the third, this is actually the third in a three-part series. I'm going to wrap it up today. You've done some, uh, at least I hope you've done some intellectual heavy lifting for the la last couple of weeks and grasped with some philosophical concepts that are not easy to grasp. And I hope it's been with, worthwhile for you. The big ideas that I've been talking about, the big ideas that steer a people and a culture, the big ideas that, that steer the course of history, that have big influences on our society, decisions we make, how we view the world. These things are vitally important, but often go by unrecognized. These big ideas that permeate through our culture and our society are kind of like the water that a fish swims in. The fish is not conscious of the water, just swimming along. And so it's, it's important that we be aware of these big ideas. And nothing is more important, really, vitally important, than that enduring question, what is truth? You remember, I began two weeks ago with that scene of Jesus standing before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, at his trial. And he said, I came to bear witness to the truth. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? And we've said that the truth is in trouble in our Western culture because we no longer agree on what is morally right and spiritually true. In fact, we can't even agree on how to determine what is true. Last week, we compared two views of the truth. The first one we called the biblical view. It says that moral and spiritual truth is objective, universal, and unchanging. It applies to all people in all times and all cultures. This truth and morality is revealed to us in Scripture and in the life of Jesus. It is the nature and character of God that determines spiritual and moral reality. Why is hatred wrong? Because God is love. Why is bitterness wrong? Because God is forgiving. Why is adultery wrong? Because God is faithful. Why is lying wrong? Because God is truthful. The nature and character of God determines spiritual and moral reality. And that's why spiritual and moral truth are objective, universal, and unchanging. Now, the other view that we looked at last week, the postmodern view that is becoming predominant in our culture, says that truth is subjective, relative, and evolving. As the world changes, as we become more aware of what's going on in our world, as our culture and society changes, so the truth must change as well, it says. And we can change the truth, the postmodern view says, because uh, we can change the truth to anything we want as long as we feel good about it and it works for us. Unfortunately, this belief is leading us to a place of moral and spiritual chaos. Remember, we started with grace and truth. And I'd like to return this morning to where I began two weeks ago. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word, of course, being Jesus Himself, full of grace and truth. Jesus had compassion for people and a passion for the truth. And that's what he expects to see in his followers, grace and truth together. Not one more than the other, not one uh, instead of the other, but both of them together. Compassion for people always goes hand in hand with passion for the truth. Truth. You know, a church that loses the truth 
of the gospel will soon wither on the vine of Christ. So getting the Christian faith right, getting the story of Jesus right, is essential for the life and health and future of the church. And that's why churches write statements of faith or belief, what we often call doctrines. We have doctrines in the United Methodist Church, and they're clearly stated in our Book of Discipline. Doctrine comes from the Latin word docere, which means to teach. Christian doctrine refers to what the Christian church has agreed upon as those teachings that are essential for the identity of God's people in Jesus Christ. And these teachings are rooted in the Bible and have been taught by the church over the centuries. Our church is in the mainstream of historic Christianity in our doctrines, our foundational beliefs. Getting doctrine correct, telling the truth, is essential because it empowers true compassion. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, German pastor and theologian who died at the hands of the Nazis in Germany, wrote, false doctrine corrupts the life of the church at its source. And that is why doctrinal sin is more serious than moral sin. Those who rob the church of the gospel deserve the ultimate penalty, whereas those who fail in morality have the gospel there to help them. Compassion for people without the truth is cheap grace and really no grace at all. Similarly, telling the truth without compassion is dead. Perhaps we could even say untrue. Passion for truth must go hand in hand with compassion for people. Grace and truth together in Jesus. It's God's plan. It's reality grounded in God's character. It's just true. Now, I said earlier that, in earlier sermons, that truth does matter. Several times in the last weeks, I have quoted the Gospel of John from chapter 8 where it says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. But the fact is, it is a truth that many people want to avoid because it involves the truth about ourselves. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall tick you off. <laughs> Sometimes the good news of Jesus is first bad news because it reveals the secrets of our own hearts. American humorist Mark Twain once wrote, I like the truth sometimes, but I don't care enough for it to hanker after it. <laughs> but Christians through the ages have sought the truth because it is grounded in God's reality. We believe there is truth with a capital T, true enough that we must live by it, even if it is inconvenient or uncomfortable for us to do so. Truth we are willing to defend, a truth that we are willing to share with others. It's that vitally important. Author Thomas Sowell, wrote these words. Listen carefully. He said, the fact that so many successful politicians are such shameless liars is not only a reflection on them, it is also a reflection on us. When the people want the impossible, only liars can satisfy them, and only in the short run. The current outbreaks of riots in Europe show what happens when the truth catches up with both the politicians and the people in the long run. Christian people, of all people, should be honest with themselves and honest with God, for that is how redemption begins. Don't we know that the truth of God is true because it is tied to reality? 
And when we live in conformity to reality, life goes much more smoothly than when we try to buck reality and truth. You can buck reality and truth for a time, but it always comes back to bite you. Consider the reading that we heard from John chapter 5 this morning. It tells of how Jesus healed a paralytic sitting beside the pool. Did you catch that later thing that Jesus said to him later on? Jesus healed him at the pool, and then he says he disappeared in the crowd. Jesus disappeared in the crowd. Then later on, Jesus found him in the crowd around the temple, and he said to him, stop sinning. What a thing to say. Stop sinning. He showed him grace. He healed him at the pool there. Then later he told him the truth. He was a sinner that needed to mend his ways. You know, some people cannot hear the truth until they have first experienced grace. Now, truth is important because it helps us defeat evil. Truth is an essential weapon in our arsenal against evil. President Ronald Reagan is often given credit for the collapse of the Soviet Union, but the dynamic that brought down the evil empire and the Iron Curtain had begun decades earlier when men like Alexander Solzhenitsyn, pictured on the right there, spoke truth to power. In 1966, long before he became an international figure, Solzhenitsyn gave a public reading at the Soviet Union's Lazarev Institute. He was an author, a novelist, and so he was gathered there with other writers and so on. And they all expected him to read from one of his novels before the group gathered there. Instead of reading from his novels, he launched into a blistering attack on censorship and the KGB. Yeah, he did spend some time in one of those uh, summer camps. That's a winter camp, too. He said the effect was explosive. Later, Solzhenitsyn would recall that almost every sentence scorched the air like gunpowder. How those people had yearned for the truth of God. How badly they wanted to hear the truth. People need the truth. Writing of Solzhenitsyn and the others who joined him, author Os Guinness says, they saw that there were only two ways to bring down the mighty Soviet tyranny. One was to trump Soviet force physically, which was impossible for a handful of dissidents. The other was to counter physical force with moral, staking their, their stand on the conviction that truth would outweigh lies and the whole machinery of propaganda, deception, and terror. They chose the latter, and the unthinkable happened. In the long run, they won. In his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, this prophet Solzhenitsyn would write, one word of truth outweighs the entire world. The evil that is within the individual human soul, the evil that is in societies and governments, is fought and overcome by the power of truth. You see, you can't tame the truth. You can't just tolerate the truth. You can't transform the truth. God's truth endures and demands a decision. Now, I do not expect that evil men will give way to absolute truth. The power of truth is not something that sways a Hitler or a Pol Pot or a Osama bin Laden. They will not bow to the claims of moral truths. The power of absolute moral truth is that it allows us to recognize and condemn evil for what it is, and it convicts us that we cannot be neutral toward that evil, and it empowers us to make the sacrifices necessary to defe defeat the evil. Again, I quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He said, let the lie come into the world, even dominate the world, but not through me. Men and women will not sacrifice all that is dear for beliefs that are nothing more than little t truths and personal moral preferences. Peter, James, 
John and Paul and, and the other apostles did not sacrifice their lives for a lie. Christian martyrs today in China, Vietnam, Sudan, Iran, other places, give themselves for truth with a capital T, the truth of God known in Jesus. Men and women will sacrifice. They will suffer. They will give their fortune, even their lives, and count it a privilege for his justice and liberty and truth. It is that faith which has stirred the hearts of men and women throughout the centuries to fight and defeat evil in this world. Beliefs have consequences. There's a lot of truth in that statement by James Allen. You are today where your thoughts have brought you. You will be tomorrow where your thoughts take you. Where are your thoughts and beliefs taking you? Beliefs that are true will lead to lives that are true. Beliefs that are right will lead to lives that are right. But beliefs that are false and wrong will lead to lives that are false and wrong. And there is no place where it's more important to believe what's true than when it comes to who God is. Look at that verse from um, Romans chapter 12, if you'll look at it with me. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Here's what this passage tells us. First of all, in a positive manner, it tells us to offer our bodies as living and holy, pleasing sacrifices to God. What that means is to behave in such a way that you please God. Behave in such a way that you please God. Have you ever told the truth to that person that really needed to hear the truth, then later wished you'd rephrased it? Yeah, in a manner pleasing to God. Sometimes people need to hear a little grace along with the truth, don't they? The second thing this verse tells us in a negative sense is, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Don't live the way you see everyone else is living. How much has postmodern thought influenced your worldview? How is all this going to happen? What does it say, these verses? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Our lives begin to change when our thinking changes because ideas and beliefs have consequences. Where do we get the best information about the biblical worldview? Where do you think? In the Bible, right? I remember my Old Testament class, very first days, Old Testament class, the, the, the hall, the lecture hall was packed full of students, and one student raised his hand, yes, professor, he'd been teaching Old Testament for 40 years. I think he was there when they wrote it. Um, <laughs> His question in the back of the room says, well, sir, what's, what's a good book we could read on Genesis? The professor's answer, Genesis. <laughs> what's a good book to read about biblical worldview? The Bible. Beliefs and ideas have consequences. American writer Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an action and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character sow a character, and you reap a destiny. We need both truth and grace. 2,000 years ago, St. Paul wrote about the people of his age and ages past. He said, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Some things never seem to change, do they? <clears throat> Regardless of the age we live in, people still need the truth. 
The Bible tells us that spiritual truths and moral values are true because they correspond to reality. Here is the truth, then, that we must keep close to our hearts so that it begins coursing through our living. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Grace, remember? That's compassion for people. That's caring for their needs and taking on their burdens beyond what they deserve. Truth. That's speaking words people need to hear and refusing to compromise the message when it's unpopular or costly. Now, some of us by personality are more drawn toward compassion and grace. We just want to hug everybody. Other of us are more inclined toward the truth. We know we need to speak the truth. God wants us to embody both, just like Jesus, who was the truth. We need grace, God's grace for all and all who will accept it. And we need grace for one another. We need the truth, truth that is grounded in the reality of God. I hope you've heard that message clearly. We need both. We're called to contend for the faith, to contend without being contentious. If any Christian had to contend for the faith, it was St. Paul. And here's what he had to say. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. What God has revealed to be true remains true, grace and truth. And I pray you will heed our Lord. If you continue in my word, he says, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Amen.